apparently he was like is there anything that I would need to reference specifically besides today's event? Or um, F A C S T R V E.
have to stand over here. <laughs> I get to welcome you on behalf of Bastyr University and the Center for Mind, Body, Spirit, and Nature, which I'm the director of. Thank you for being here for this wonderful opportunity to hear Pat Adams, who's generously donated his time tonight so that this could be for free for all of us. So, Thanks and appreciation. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. It's also my pleasure to let you know, in case you haven't been to our campus before, that where the restrooms are. So I always like to know where those are. So it gives me pleasure to know that you know where they are. And they're just right here outside, down this hallway a little bit. Um, I'd also like you to, to invite you, in case you uh, are new to last year, to follow up with us for future events. If you're interested, there's a sign-up sheet for our email newsletter on the tea table. Um, we also have Bastyr University Facebook page and a center, Bastyr University Center for Mind, Body, Spirit, and Nature Facebook page. And we are um, recording this for our students and colleagues in San Diego at our branch campus, and we'll post the video, we'll post the link on um, the bastyr.edu site. What are my other things? Oh, um, our bookstore is open tonight um, just because of this event and has snacks, but also is selling Dr. Patch's book. Um, so you can find that right there in the bookstore. <coughs> oh, I just wanted to let you know what our upcoming events are too. That in a couple of weeks on Tuesday, April 14th, we'll be hosting two of the interfaith amigos, Rabbi Ted Falcon and Sheikh Jamal Rahman, who will be speaking and um, having a conversation about the healing power of interfaith dialogue. That'll be in our chapel on Tuesday the 14th. And then on Thursday the 16th will be the monthly iteration of our Death and Cupcakes conversation series, intergenerational conversation. Uh, and you might not think of it from the title, but it's so full of life and really warm-hearted and lovely. And that's at our clinic, the Bastyr Center in Wallingford, on Thursday the 16th from 6.30 to 8.30. What um, are my other things? Is that it? And then I um, wanted to really acknowledge our faculty, acupuncture and oriental medicine faculty, Brenda Lowe. And I'm going to say a few words about her and then ask her to introduce her dear friend, Patch, because it's because of Brenda that this is more than an idea and actually a reality. But I want you to know about Brenda that besides being one of our dear faculty, beloved <coughs> teachers, she's also considered really a teacher and a leader in our community and our profession, the acupuncture profession and she is a social change activist through and through herself. So from the Buddhist point of view, we think of Brenda as what's called a bodhisattva, as someone who hears and responds to the suffering of the world <clears throat> with not only swiftness and skillfulness, but also really good humor. So I'm gonna give this to Brenda so she can introduce to you her really good friend, Patch Adams. take a lot of time. Um, I wanted to read a quote from Martin Luther King. Um, you will, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Patch Adams. Raise your hand. Okay. So, that, you may have an idea of him being this goofy doctor, and you must understand that that was Hollywood, and the real person is so much more than that. And those of you who have the, uh, whatever, I was going to say, the, um, the, the um, challenge of having me as a teacher um, know that I'm constantly raising the issue of what does it mean to be a true human being? What is true healing? And um, Patch embodies all of that. Um, he is a radical, radical meaning going back to the root of what it is to be a true human being. He, he carries values that we need desperately in this day and age. And um, I was gonna read a quote from Martin Luther King um, quickly. There are certain things in our nation and in the world which I am proud to be maladjusted and which I hope all men of goodwill will be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I say very honestly that I never intend to become adjusted to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that we take necessities from the many 
to give luxuries to the few. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism, to self-defeating effects of physical violence. He said this many, many, many times. So I am proud and I, I cherish um, Patch who embodies creative maladjustment and um, he is a true human being and it's rare to encounter somebody <coughs> Uh, anymore who's not afraid to stand up and say this is what it means to be human this is what it means to be healing to be caring and loving and Patch, I cherish you so much for your care and your love over all the years and thank you for coming If there's an empty seat next to you, there's some people in the back. Shamelessly go and sit. <laughs> Before I begin, I tell all my audiences that I answer all my mail. I am a relic. I write letters. I don't know how to use a computer. I've never had an iPhone. And it's going to probably stay that way. I'll be 70 next month, so I think I'm on a roll. <laughs> and I write four to 600 personal longhand letters a month. I've done it for over 40 years. I write 120 countries, and I'm caught up. <laughs> Even though I'm on the road 300 days a year now for 30 years. Oh, wow. To give you an idea, my last 10 days was one day at uh, one of the state universities of New York, one day in Mexico City, five cities in five days in Italy, one day in San Francisco, one day in Montreal, two days home and now here. So I'm not letting moss grow under my feet. So if you need a friend, have ideas no one will listen to, want to exchange thoughts on anything, want a book suggestion, my library is about 40,000 books, I'm well read, I know all of them, and uh, if you just want to hate me, write me, there are two requirements, it needs to be in English, or American, and it needs to have a really clear return address, I've never not answered a letter, so if you didn't get an answer, Something happened in the post office, or it didn't get to me, or it didn't get to you, so write again, please. I call this talk, I went on the road 30 years ago because I really had failed in raising funds to build a hospital that I worked on now in the 45th year. And so I have 50 presentations. This was the first one, Medicine for Fun, Not Funds. It talks about our work. I entered medical school in 1967 to use medicine as a vehicle for social change. I'm a political activist. I'm here to end market capitalism. I consider the worst disease of human history and the probable cause of our extinction. And so I knew that medicine was a really greedy business and I entered medical school because I knew I was going to be free. I didn't have to study much. so. I had a lot of free time and I studied healthcare delivery systems, not just current, but around the world and throughout history with the idea to create a model when I graduated that would address every problem of the way care was delivered in one model. I graduated in 1971. No one said, hey, Pat, here's a hospital. Darn. <laughs> so I did what people have done in very poor countries. We used our home as a hospital. I knew very early in my life that I'm a communal person. So 20 adults and their children moved into a large six-bedroom house and said we were a hospital. Three of us were physicians. We were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all manner of medical problems from birth to death. We did this for 12 years. Our idea was that everything would be free, and not free for poor people. We wanted to eliminate the idea of debt in the medical interaction. We never wanted anyone to feel they owed something. We wanted them excited they belonged to something called community. 
in that same flavor, we never heard anyone say anything nice about insurance companies, so we've never had anything to do with public or private insurance, which controls the way medicine is practiced in this country. And this issue of malpractice, you know, you can never ever know before a treatment, no matter how grandmasterly you are, the results of your treatment. And so it's pretty scary to think you're responsible for making a mistake because you're going to make huge numbers of mistakes or learn to lie about them or shove them on somebody else. And so we're the only hospital in this country refusing to have anything to do with malpractice insurance because we need the right to make a mistake. If someone is an unhealthy practitioner, they shouldn't be practicing. But everyone else is imperfect and needs that right. Now I'm a family doctor and I wondered I was taught to be a family doctor in 7.8 minutes. And you can be something in 7.8 minutes, but you can't be a doctor. Why the hell did you learn all that stuff? And why did you learn all the stuff they didn't teach you? So, since it was our hospital, I could do what I wanted. My initial interview with a patient is four hours long, unbelievably intense. I ask every question sensitive to life. You cannot imagine a personal question I didn't ask the person. No matter how private it was, I checked it all out. My first question was, tell me about yourself. And they knew they had hours. <laughs> but I'm really interested in a person's self-description. Who will they say they are? Almost never did someone speak for more than five minutes. Which is a little embarrassing. You know, it might be good for a newborn. <laughs> and, you know, it's very interesting. I found 3% of the people I've interviewed like that in 48 years had self-esteem. So almost no one in this country loves themselves. I love me. Less than 5% had any idea what a day-to-day -day vitality for life was about. Yay, life. And the normal adult didn't like themselves, didn't like their marriage, didn't like their job, and that wasn't why they were coming to the doctor. Was this ever mentioned in medical school? Not once. In fact, my concept of health when I entered medical school was it, it was about the health and diseases of individuals, the health and diseases of families, the health and diseases of communities, and the health and diseases of the world, and I was only educated in diseases of individuals. Hmm. As a family doctor, no professor ever said, you know, most families are <laughs> fucked up, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and that that's not good for your health, really. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And I didn't get one lecture on health, not one lecture on health, not diet, not exercise. Love was never mentioned in medical mm. school. It might interest you, no medical school in the world teaches compassion. Wow. They might have a Saturday optional class. <laughs> <laughs> and in the four hour interviews, this was 1971 when we started, there wasn't a wellness movement. The word wellness wasn't even used. And that most people, if you spent four hours with them, I also visited the home of every patient because I'm a snoop. And I could see that almost no patients actually wanted to take care of the, their health. It was cut the crap, doc, give me a pill. It was much more common a response. I also realized I had a really imperfect education in chronic illness. Mm. That medicine is great, say, with a gunshot wound. It's, it's one of its best and most useful car accidents. But with chronic illness, the pharmaceutical companies have such a stranglehold on medicine that they actually were calling all of the history of medicine outside of allopathic medicine quackery. In Virginia, where I started, the only, and by the way, in 1971, no one ever used the words alternative, complementary, or integrative. They were never used. In fact, 
what we call ourselves are humanistic or holistic because those words were not used and only chiropractic in Virginia was allowed everything else was against the law I don't mean somebody called it quackery I'm saying you could be sued thrown in jail acupuncture homeopathy naturopathy Ayurvedic, anthroposophic, herbal medicine, body work, faith healing, were all given an extreme negativity. The treatment, imagine how stupid this is. The treatment for your back when you throw it out, three months of bed rest. Wow, do they sell beds? Is that some of their money? Inside? And so we broke the law and did all of those things right away <laughs> because we break the law the law is what can help the patient what do you feel good about doing with the patient and that's a conundrum itself because your patients actually didn't want to take care of themselves how can you you can't make a person exercise you can trick them <laughs> so we tricked people into doing aerobics by having three all-night fast rock and roll parties a week <laughs> where the epic was dance as long as you can <laughs> so we weren't doing aerobics we were partying <laughs> oh that's good <laughs> And we did a lot of tricky things. So the food was free at the house and we were really poor. And so we became farmers. Kind of like the hippie commune thing of the, the 60s really were 65 to 75. They just forgot that, I guess they did too much smoking in the 60s to remember it also included the first half of the 70s. So, What was interesting, okay, you, you heard there was a six-bedroom house with 20 adults and their children living there. We had 500 to 1,000 people in our home each month with five to 50 overnight guests a night. And I'm sure you can do the math. Six bedrooms, 20 adults and their children living there, five to 50 overnight guests a night. Let's just say there was a lot of interaction going on. <laughs> If I then told you that we chose never to give any psychiatric diagnoses or psychiatric medications, we could say it was probably a stimulating environment. <laughs> <laughs> At least 3,000 people who would have been heavily labeled psychiatrically came and stayed in our home. We put ourselves on the line. My closest friend in medical school was murdered by one of our patients. Mm -hmm. If you saw the movie, they made him a her and happening in medical school. It actually was my closest male friend and it happened six years after graduation. We had one rule, no physical fighting. Verbally, you could be creative. <laughs> but, if you did any physical fighting or invade a woman's space, you had to leave instantly. There was no recourse. You could come back, but you had to leave that instant. It was so thrilling to do. I love being a doctor. I did it exactly the way that felt good to me, and I was with lots of friends doing it all the time that we were farmers. I was a goat herder for eight years, 30 goats. We always had all of the arts thriving, so we always had a play in production because most everything patients are wrestling with is said really well in theater. Mm -hmm. We also, as you heard, used not just music for dancing, but music, many musicians came there and performed. There was always the visual arts, most all of the arts were being done there. It was kind of like an artist's colony. I learned to live on two to five hours a night's sleep because I didn't want to miss anything, and <laughs> lunacy happens best after midnight. 
<laughs> That's the most creative work that we did. We were kind of like a, our mental health work was like Monty Python. <laughs> and you'll understand that if I say that we did barfalongs with bulimics. <laughs> we played with the world and had a tremendous time. We were never arrested. We were never sued. We made millions of mistakes. We made nothing. During that time, I tried 1,400 foundation applications because I designed a hospital that eliminates 90% of the cost of care, where all the permanent staff live together as a communal eco-village. Everyone from the cleaning person to the surgeon makes the same salary, $300 a month and still, basically, in 44 years, almost no one has donated to us. The movie made a half a billion dollars and promised to build our hospital and didn't give us ten dollars. Oh, wow. And I'm still pretty much, now I'm 0 for 1,800 in foundation grants to show you my perfect record. During those 12 years, no one gave us a donation, so our staff worked outside jobs to pay to practice medicine. So really, for me, 44 years, I paid to be a doctor. And I say that without any sense of sacrifice or long and hard journey. Rather to say the unencumbered practice of care is an ecstatic experience worth paying to do. Mm -hmm. I love doing it. Your job is to be in practice with love and fun and to see what can happen with your incomplete instruments. Harder than giving up money for a lot of people is giving up privacy. We never had anything ever resembling privacy. A bathroom with someone on the toilet, someone at the sink, someone in the bathtub, and a couple of people hanging out. <laughs> there was probably an increased incidence of constipation. <laughs> It never let up. The, our home was full of neediness and loneliness, anxiety, danger, all of the time, every single day, usually day and night. And yet the first nine years, no staff people left. And this is really what the Hollywood movie picked up on, because two things sell in Hollywood, violence and humor. Not love, by the way, unless it's a romantic comedy. So, it was so interesting to be loony in the extreme ways we were loony. And it was extreme all the time and that it was too interesting to leave. After nine years, one day the people got together and said, Patch, look, we're never going to have a hospital. And we've given our lives for it and we just can't do it anymore. I uh, didn't feel that way myself and I kind of went out in the woods and cried. Probably the one time I, I, I'm not a believer in, of any other worldly source. But I said, you know, if there's a sign, there's a good time for a sign. I, I didn't get a sign. Bernie Bush. <laughs> but I did see that I had to continue. So I tried another group of people for three years, and we had a great time. But the same thing happened. What was really true was that our ideas were right, but we need a place. Every staff person needs a room of their own that every staff person needs space for their interests. So if you are a costume designer, you have a place to go and do costume design, not one table that has six different events in it during the course of the day, and your costuming is three to five. That we needed and wanted a fully modern hospital to show that the fully modern technological hospital could be operated at 10% of the cost. And so I bit the lip and said, we're going to have to close our doors and raise money. And what sells in this country certainly isn't intelligence, 
<laughs> it's Spain that sells in this country. And I knew that ideas aren't famous, again, it's not that kind of country, and that people are famous, and I knew I would have to be a famous person. If you realize that I haven't seen a TV show in 35 years, you might imagine my connection to pop culture. <laughs> that uh, I wrote my first book, and it was um, very well reviewed in the morning it came out on NPR, and my next day the, my mug was on the cover of USA Today, and the next day Hollywood called. So in 84, when we closed our door, from there until that Hollywood call was nine years, and I was going all over the world, I have five million frequent flyer miles, and I was planting seeds of revolution, nonviolent revolution, and within a year I realized that I missed care, that whatever my other interests are, I am really love to be with suffering. I like to be with the worst suffering. And because it doesn't hurt me, it is something I want to do. And so I realized I can't do it by seeing patients, so how can I do it? And I've clowned pretty much every day since I was 18. I started clowning as a youth as a way to protect myself as a weird, nerd, dweeb, dork, sissy boy from being bullied by goofing with the bullies. They didn't hit their fool. But at 18, when I kind of had the earthquake of my life and I became the person I am now, I have clowned every day. And so I thought, okay, I can go clowning in care. So in 1985, we started our first clown trip. It was the Reagan years, and so the Soviet Union was the enemy, Ooh. and so I said basic peace work is go and love your enemy. So I started our first clown trip to the Soviet Union, and this will be the 31st year. If you all want to come here and sit on the floor, you're welcome to do it. Are there any more spare chairs? Okay, raise your hand if you have a spare chair next to you. Don't be shy. I'm not recommending to be. What do I know about shy? <laughs> so, Sorry. in Russia, again, what we've done for 31 years, it's 10 hours a day of clowning. Hospitals, orphanages, nursing homes, we've done prisons, institutions, Subways, restaurants, hotels, nobody is safe. <laughs> We've taken ages 3 to 88 from 50 countries. We don't require any training. You can be the most boring person from your country. <laughs> In a clown costume, that becomes a character. A really boring person. <laughs> and it sucks you in because we take you to such suffering that you can't hold back your goodness. And uh, it works. 23 years ago, we were so unhappy with the way orphans are taken care of in Russia. They have probably the worst reputation of orphanages in the world. And so we started to take care of our own kids and have four to 600 kids in Moscow. Then we said, what the hell, let's take clowns into war. So five times we've taken clowns right into the thick of war. Countless refugee camps. We were in Sri Lanka after the, right after the tsunami and right after the earthquake in Haiti. So I've led about 150 clown trips. I estimate I've been at 10,000 deathbeds as a clown mm. and that have probably held at least 2,000 children the day they died of starvation in my arms. So I've seen a lot of hell. Being a lousy fundraiser, we are now active in 40 countries. So 10 years ago in the Peruvian Amazon, we found three five-year-olds in one day with gonorrhea. 
and said, this sucks. I'd already been working for 20 years against child sexual slavery, so we started a lifetime project there. After the movie, my speaking fees went way up. <laughs> and since I don't keep money, I was able to give one talk and build a clinic in a poor country. And so we've been doing that. Basically, it's still in time because I'm still the worst fundraiser in American history. <laughs> trying to build our hospital. In 1980, we bought 321 acres in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, the poorest state for health care. We have three waterfalls, caves behind the waterfalls, a four-acre lake, a mountain of hardwood trees, rich bottomland that's had no chemicals in it since 1980, land with black bear and otter and beaver, along with some humans. <laughs> we have built three smaller buildings and in 2011, we started building our first big building, which is way behind when I thought it would be built, but it's really thrilling. And I'm always an optimistic person, so I still think we're going to be funded soon. <laughs> and we're going to work our butts off before that. We've just gotten funding for two vet trips. I've don't know if you know, 6,000 vets kill themselves a year, 22 a day, and I don't like that. I'm a war orphan myself and saw the damage that even if you fought in a good war like World War II, it still destroyed your soul. And so I was talking at Walter Reed and have just gotten the funding to take uh, really damaged vets on clown trips, so we're kind of mm. excited about that. So I think that kind of takes us up to the present. Again, I feel really optimistic. You know, I, I'm a whore. I, I go all over the country, world and <clears throat> try to sell the idea of nonviolent revolution. You know, if you've read the number of economics books that I have and study the things that I have, you would understand why I say that nothing I study says we're going to survive this century. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm reporting to you. If you read the 2,000 books on the environment I have, you'd be concerned. So, I'm hoping, if you're not already an activist, that you get jarred this evening. Never too late to start. Bertrand Russell was arrested in his mid-90s for anti-nuclear work. And I wonder if he knew where he was. <laughs> so, I could, uh, I, I would now throw it open to questions. I also, I don't know if you'd like to, I brought a film to show an idea of what I mean by clowning. Because I, I do juggle and rope walk and unicycle. But I don't do that as a clown. I, my style, is I go to a hospital, if, I, if it's a hospital setting, and I say, please, and I ask the nurses, take me to who is suffering the most. And so I'd show you one of those cases to give you an idea of what I mean. This is in Ecuador, and they, the reason they took me to this room is that a mother and her son was there, the son was in his 30s, and it's very easy, you'll see a obviously recent open heart surgery scar on his chest. And whatever they did, and I wasn't notified what it was, didn't work. And now he's in for his second operation. And the reason they took me to them is that they were both in a deep despair, panic, that he was not going to survive the operation. You're not going to see any panic, but I want you to know that that's why they took me to the room. You actually will see the whole interaction, so it's 15 or 18 <coughs> minutes. And if, particularly if you're a student or if you haven't been around, you can wonder what would you do? What would you do if you 
walked in a room where a mother and her son were in a panic about the upcoming surgery. I will tell you some things I'm doing so you can see them. The mother was like my mother and everything you like about me came from my mother. And I saw that this mother was that kind of mother, the way she looked at her son. And I knew that if the son was comfortable, the mother would be instantly blissed. And what a goal is, if, if a family is entering surgery like this, is that, you know, going in panicked, freaked out, scared, with all the intensity of a mother saying, is not the best psychoneuroimmunology. <laughs> You'd like him to go under in the anesthesia, thrilled to be seeing his mom in a few hours. And for her to have had either the greatest last moment with her son mm -hmm. in memory or a lot of juice and hope for the operation. And one doesn't do that in the way I was taught in medical school, you have to kind of do that on your own. So we'll turn the light off. I might point out some things, would that be all right? Yes. Please understand, there's, you will notice nothing I do takes any skill whatsoever. <laughs> takes audacity and loving people. Ding. Oh. It was 2131 was my memory of it. By the way, we do six clown trips a year. Everyone is welcome. Everyone pays their own way. Oh, 21, 19, 20. Okay. During the course of this, at least 17 of the staff came in and joined us. <laughs> like this, you can do anything with this person you want. This is your sister. Okay. You remember when you were children. Yes, sir. You were still home, holding her hand. And, and skipping along. Yeah. Looking at the birds and stayed out late and missed lunch. Your mother was a little upset. <laughs> but your sister put in a good word to the mother. <laughs> and she forgave you. <laughs> so 
so I think you should kiss your sister. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was nice. Oh, see, oh, then maybe the other one is lonely. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Friday is now <laughs> Oh boy. Yes. I also had a good mother. Uh -huh. Yes. And you had a good mother. Yes. No longer sister. <laughs> when a boy has a good mother, he turned out well. What did your mother do? Good education. Good education. About what? What was mother's important education? Different than the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. So teachers give a good education. It's more at home. They receive a good education. And your mother taught you to be a good man. Yes, all of us. A kind man. Not macho, not macho man, no, boom, boom, loving, loving, I wanted him to put his head in her lap, but you'll see that he realizes with his heart condition he can't lay down. It's not good? Okay, okay. okay. so you sit next to him. Next to him. Okay, sit, 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 sit. and rock, rock like me. <laughs> then you'll hear her sing the song lullaby she sang to him as a child. <laughs> This is the most beautiful moment I can remember. <laughs> this is... I have to sit here. This is, she needs to be president. Yeah. You understand? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Every country in the world needs mamas like this for president. <laughs> Because if every country had her for president, no one would be hungry. <laughs> Armies could build houses for poor people. And no one would be in peace. 
the whole world will be in peace. Let's hold hands. <laughs> the world will be in peace. Oh. It's possible. You want to come in? Okay, come here. You're going to watch. Come on. <laughs> we are holding hands because with his mama as president, everywhere the world will be in peace. <laughs> We have a song in English that came from John Lennon. From the Beatles. A very simple song. All we are saying is give peace a chance. So let's just rock and go. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Sometimes corny is healing. All we are saying is give peace a chance. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Everybody, all we are saying is give. Exactly like my mother, 
I take a little bit. So, Mama, fill up my hands with your soul. Yes. And I will, I will drink from the Universal Mother. <laughs> Alexa? You want like a drink of the universal mother? You like? If you like me, you like my mother. Okay, yes, of course. <laughs> the mother shower, if you want. This is just to celebrate mother. You want to celebrate mother? Yes. And notice it's still full. It's still full because the mother is never empty. You can say, tell mother it's still full. <laughs> Mother's love is never empty. <laughs> Such a beautiful moment. Oh boy. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, oh. Since I'm glad. One day we will be able to say the same thing about fathers. <laughs> Hold one second, there'll be a dark portion because I found out that they were strongly Christian, so I invited them in for to do a prayer. So Oh he is? Well let's have a little prayer. Would you like a... Be patient. This is a good time to do some smooching. If you want to say it loud enough to the people who don't understand English, we're all here together. Ah. But in this moment, the prayers are in this room. For this wonderful pair of people. This afternoon, another operation. You made such a good heart, you want to come in again and rest in my mind. I know it will come out wonderfully. Because you are here. Thank you for the life you have given me. And for the life I have yet to live. I promise to work for you. By loving all people. Amen. Okay. A fart for good luck. Fart for good luck. <laughs> Clown love is fatal. <laughs> so I want you to all point your tongues to his heart. Watch the mother part on her son. Like this. <laughs> Did everyone do it? Let me see. Okay. Um, now we know it will 
work well. <laughs> I love you. Thank 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 you. I haven't shown that in very many schools for health care, and I just, was it valuable to see? Oh, yes. Thank you. You know, I'm trying to give you an idea that being with patients is heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, life never gets better than that for me, and, and it happens no matter how profound the illness, you can find that place with whoever you're with can't believe your good fortune to be there in that moment. Okay, now you can ask any question or make any comments. You can challenge me in any way. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you've ever heard of the Buy Nothing Project? The Buy Nothing Project. I've heard of things that sound like that. I mean, certainly there's the Ad Busters does things about that, and so I'm guessing you want to say something about it? It just reminds me of the work that you do for no change of money. And it's a project that started in Seattle. It's one moment. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Project your voice. Okay. <laughs> this is projecting your voice. I'll bet you can hear me, right? Yeah. 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 Right. So I asked Patch if he's ever heard of the Buy Nothing Project, which um, started in Seattle on Bainbridge Island. And it's basically a hyper-local gifting economy where people use Facebook to exchange goods and services for no cost. Um, and it's absolutely my favorite thing about pretty, my favorite thing about living in Seattle. Um, and people exchange um, helping with childcare. They post um, for needing food. Um, so it's it's wonderful. Well, we certainly need another kind of economy <laughs> where we get rich by being in love and get rich by enjoying of the arts and nature. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And you know, if you live together, the dumbest sociological move in history was nuclear family. No country does it well. It's failing in every country. We are by nature of many millions of years group animals. We cannot afford nuclear families and living alone anymore because everyone wants their half acre so we don't have any more trees. Yes ma'am? Um, have you ever thought of allying yourself with uh, one of the physician groups that is for single-payer health care like Physicians for National Health Care Program or some you know there are several other groups that are actually you know political activists have you ever thought of going that route? Well, I am that proud. <laughs> and I have, I mean, I, I've sent them donations. They haven't sent me any. <laughs> and so, yes, I, I, I wasn't for a national health plan for years. You know, I think we should tax the rich 95% and that all health care should be free. But I, I grew to to realize that this country's... So when I first met Steffi Wallhandler and, and the other people who founded it, I, I actually didn't originally put my name to it because I just looked like another compromise, like Obamacare plus. And, but it, things got so bad in this country that I did start to support them. You know, it's... I. I would have liked, I hope that in their practice, they're all doing it. So if you don't ask questions, I recite poetry. I know four hours of poetry. <laughs> Unbelievable poems. Yes, ma'am. Going back to the video, um, I loved how you 
identified what they were needing. They were needing that connection, and, and their fear was so great that they couldn't get there themselves. It just makes me cry. It's, it was beautiful. So my question is, what does it look like, or have you encountered somebody who was just too angry and, and too despondent and, and didn't want you in the room? What, what, what does that situation look like? Well, I, was, I clowned for five men in Trinidad who were hung the next day for capital crimes. One of them just was panicked and wanted me to be another desperate possibility to save him. Four of them loved it. I don't know if that's what you mean. There are times when you're clowning, because I clown all the time, so there are times clowning on the street when you can see, you know, certainly homophobes are, are frightened of strange men. <laughs> that kind of thing. Sometimes kids, if you walk in a room, they can scream. But usually on a clown trip, I'm with 30 people or enough people, and, and that one can decide in the same way. Th this couple was really easy. I instantly saw how much they loved each other, so I, all I had to do was just hose him. And, and, and and I, I knew they were extremely easy. That probably the most screaming comes from children who might, if you walk in a room, might initially scream. And you can decide to spend the next hour, you know, sometimes I act as if they just shot me and I'm dead on the floor and see how long I can stay there emotionless. <laughs> As a large person, I squat down, and you can see. I don't take offense to anything. You know, I'm not ever looking for a smile or laughter. That's not my goal. My goal is to be present mm. and to be improvisational. To it's very so in chronic mental hospitals, the kind that used to be in the U.S. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you can still go to. We were just in one in Guatemala just a nightmare place and it didn't happen for me there, it did happen for some people, but a lot of people are new to it. I'm really comfortable in it and you know they're not doing it for you, they're, they're bringing them and every all of the stuff they bring with them that makes them scream in that moment and so sometimes it means holding them when our hospital was open, my longest hug was 12 hours. And so, you know, we never gave psychiatric medication, and sometimes I said, I'm never going to let go till you fall asleep. And I, I think if you don't take offense, and you're present, and you, if they're saying get out of the room, I don't stay in the room. But, I mean, I wouldn't care if I thought what would have worked there would be a woman. What do I care what works? I, I mean, I never, no loyalty to anything, so if I thought anything would work, I would be for that. I, I think you can, you can take the, the challenge to see what, what it would take to connect. Because all, all of, most everyone in this room is old enough to know how difficult it is and how many times a day they're faced with whether or not they actually want to try to connect with the person they're, connect, they're with. <laughs> the clerk, the person on the phone with the IRS or whatever it is that you're, because you're constantly faced with that challenge for how distant we are from each other. I found almost everyone from this country to be lonely. I almost assume a person is lonely until they say otherwise, until they show otherwise. That's why our hospital when it was open, you never needed to make an appointment. You could just come by at any time. If you didn't cook, you cleaned up. That kind of thing. Yeah, but, you know, I want, I don't want to be killed. So, and sometimes there are people disturbed enough to where you have to decide. So if somebody came, that any of the, there is a policy that if any staff person was frightened, 
and at least two people stayed with the person all the time as their friends. And uh, <coughs> so far it's worked out. I mean, when we've gone into war, we've gone into very scary situations. So far, bullets bounce off clowns. <laughs> There's another question, yes. Uh, will you clarify your... Can you say loud? Uh, just uh, <laughs> project your voice. <laughs> La, project the voice. <laughs> will you clarify your revolution that you've been describing and what your, your visions of the end goals to that? I want a world where no one alive can remember what the word war means. Yeah. They have to look it up in a dictionary because they wouldn't believe that strangers would charge each other with weapons and kill each other for the people that are staying at home making a lot of money from it. So those are, you know, I'd like us to not act like we're arrogant with nature because nature doesn't care who is extinct. Nature just evolves. <laughs> And there are a lot of things that'll stick around no matter how badly we treat nature ourselves, but we're fragile. So I would, and I think market capitalism, you heard me say, is the worst disease of history. Uh, it's hard for me to think of a problem I want different that isn't connected to it now. I can't think of a government on the planet I really respect. You know, I, if you look at history, every problem in history is due to men. I mean, it seems like we need about a thousand years where women are in charge of everything. <laughs> you know, it's inexcusable that there are billionaires. I mean, it's okay to be a billionaire if you give away 99 point something percent of your money. Then you're actually really useful. And if you have organizational skills and a big organization, then you can use them to... I just try to tell them extinction means them too. You know, if you have a 5,000 person private army, it's not going to protect you when things get really bad. And so, yeah, it, it might interest you not one, let me poll the audience, raise your hand if you can think of something more important than loving. And so I've asked 79 countries, I estimate 40 million people in audiences in all of this time. And maybe 10 people raised their hand. So loving's the most important thing in life, the verb. And not one public school in the world in K through 12 teaches one hour in 13 years of the most important thing in life. So the biggest initiative I have is the teaching of the intelligence of loving, not the emotion. The intelligence of love, K through 12, one hour a day, five days a week for 13 years. We would be a different people. But I think everyone decides on the day they wake up how they're going to be that day. I think each person can decide to be exactly their instrument for peace and justice and care. And my encouragement is to get to work. No free time. Or, I see you want a poem. I feel it coming. Yes, ma'am? I'm going to project. Um, given that there are different types of personalities, I know in my culture we tend to be very uptight and rigid and, you know, embarrassed in situations like that. So how do you, when you see that with the patient, do you try to break that barrier, or what is the way that you go through it, and what is your end kind of goal with it? I'm not sure many people heard you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just stand up and just for fun practice at least saying the beginning of the kind of patient that you're concerned about or wondering about? So, uh, given that there's different personalities, and that some people in certain cultures are a little bit more uptight or tend to be embarrassed, then how do you take care of that patient when they start to get uncomfortable? Do you proceed and go further to break their barrier, or what do you do in that moment, and what's your end purpose in it? You know, one thing I'd recommend is, for me, a healer is never 
off. There's never out to lunch. So everywhere you are, you're practicing your human relations and your ability to relax another person that you're with. Twinkling in the eyes, smile on your face, willingness to greet. I found I've only worn clown clothes for 30 years because I, I found that clowning is a trick to get love close. That as a clown, you saw what I could do. Most doctors would be scared, poopless, to try something like that with patients. But as a clown, I can do anything and that people will let me. <laughs> and so you, if you're a health professional, and that's what you're asking, right? If, if one is a health professional and you're getting a grouchy, angry? No, like, let's say just uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Well, I trick them by being free, right? <laughs> it's free, I invite them in my home to spend a couple of days as friends. You hear the trickiness there. <laughs> and I, I mean, when our hospital was open, I gave them four hours of my time of intense interest for who they were, and then went and visited them in their home. So a lot of people that you're describing have not, don't have anyone that treats them that way. And so, you know, you can read people. If people really look at someone, you can, you can learn a lot. And you can gain in skills at being a human being. And being, if, you're, if you decide to be universally friendly, after about five years of universal friendliness, you're going to find that almost anyone is easy. If, if I were a woman, a woman, I knew it would be so much easier. Because people start uptight with men. I mean, no country was ever safe to its women, so women have to walk around knowing they're not entirely safe. Some women never actually feel safe. That's how dangerous our world is to a woman. So, I'm large, I'm six foot four, so goofy and freak Katie you know, I'm, I, I can give you an idea, okay? I can change this conservative look very easily to something that will be hard for them to stay serious with. Right? So if I just walk, walk up to them like this, you see the problem these people here are having. So, so it's actually your dis because even before, if you went, if you're, if you're in school here, if you're in any kind of healing classes, as soon as you reach adulthood, you already know that huge numbers of people are uptight. <laughs> you already know how few people, when you're walking down the street and your eyes meet, that you actually see a moment of sparkle. <laughs> that we're a, such a profoundly unhealthy society. And so you can become a person who decides that you're going you're gonna to add. You're going to add to an environment so that I can reach in this pocket and uh, get my very important medical device. I <laughs> got I would hope that that felt strong to put people at ease and then notice the convenience I can reach in this pocket here and uh, maybe this will help. <laughs> and finally, if that doesn't work, I'll reach for the big guns. In Spanish, it's called Noto. <laughs> And I'm willing to go this far if I have to. <laughs> and the real question is, is that how far would you go? What? <laughs> Almost everyone is lonely. 
almost no one loves themselves. And you can know that before you walk in the room with somebody who's uncomfortable with you. And you can even say, are you uncomfortable? You can actually be one of the first straight shooters they ever met. <laughs> and be real, and whatever that means. And, and as a woman, you have, can have a really easy time unless they're dangerous to you. And if you see things, like if, take the, the two people in this film, you could see how much the mother loved her son, right? And she was seeing her son really happy before he's going to face this possibly killing surgery and that he was having a great time. So there was no difficulty there. And I actually like it when it's difficult because then you learn things about yourself. But if you don't give up, you can say, look, I'm sorry, am I making you uncomfortable? Should I go get on my suit? You know, it's a joke. <laughs> but you, you play. You're, you're, if you're natural, almost everyone becomes natural, unless they're actually physically threatened by you. And if, if you're a practitioner and they're coming to your office and you're free, it's going to be... And there are lots of toys around and don't have to fill out too many forms and, <laughs> and those kinds of things that you, you, from the moment I'm recommending for the rest of your life, you develop your most playful, sweet self. Mm. And you'll see that almost everyone is won over. Mm. Write me a letter about some of your experiments. <laughs> and try a booger. <laughs> <laughs> I was suggesting to a friend of mine tonight that maybe if we walked around with just tidy whities on their heads, something <laughs> could happen. <laughs> Mouse and hands are going up. Yes, sir? Um, can you tell me what the prognosis of that gentleman was that was in the film? You know, regrettably, right after that, we left to come home. So I actually don't know what happened to him. I'm... And, uh, you know, I'm not, it was not my job to be involved with his cardiac problem. I, my job was to have him go into that operation with the disposition you saw that he was in, which was probably an ideal situation to enter an operation with the best of spirits and, and hope. And so I know even if he died that his mother had a great last memory and Yes, it's painful if your child dies, and, you know, her last memory was farting on his car, <laughs> which is going, to, which is tricky. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. When I'm, when I'm clowning, or, and if I'm their physician, I, I know a lot of things, but if, they're, if I'm not and I'm clowning, I feel my job is mostly to relieve suffering. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes? Okay. Oh, all right. um, do you have any recommendations for people that want to be playful and want to go as far as they can to make someone feel good, but maybe are working in community health or community mental health and have the boundaries that they have to follow that they can't Ooh. Well, what about the thrill of a challenge? Okay, so what do doctors that are going to be pediatricians do? They wear a bow tie. Okay, that's not an uncommon thing. And for that, for them, that's kind of wild, a bow tie. So, one thing, feel excited for being the pioneer for that, for that situation. So one, work so that everyone really loves you. Put a vibe at your workplace of hard work, of caring for everybody, of doing a great job, and then you can get away with it. Get away with it. <laughs> and, okay, show me the data. 
There's not a single paper in the history of science showing any value ever to being serious. <laughs> or professional. Or rude. Or hierarchical. So you can kind of use the Columbo approach and go, you know, I'm not normally a funny person. But look at this in their umpteen books on the value of humor and umpteen studies physiology, biochemistry, you know, I, I'm professional working here and I really love my job, but you know, I'm having a complex situation with some of the patients and I just thought, of, uh, look at these studies, maybe I could be goofier. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But you, you, uh, how do we change the world? For, you know, we murdered two million Iraqi people for business. How do we get out of that world? Okay, so how do we, if you have any friends, there's a good chance at least three of them right now are really suffering. Hmm. You know, you've got them to play with. Every, everywhere you go is your opportunity to, to add and delight an environment with your personality and, and that you develop it. And everything that I'm talking about is validated in all the research. To be joyful, to be loving, to be funny, to be creative, to be community, all have huge papers reinforcing it and none of the crap that people will criticize you about has any papers for it. None. If you could just help me understand how hierarchy helps make me be a better person, or, you know, I've tried rudeness, but I just, you know. <laughs> There's a question down here. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I wonder, as with my clients, uh, I, I can tend to be, like, more serious to try to really be empathic with them and listen to them. And then I wonder um, how much, what percentage of time do you, just kind of goof and laugh to, to make the, the situation light versus um, uh, being kind of serious with them or? Well, remember, when you asked me about my being a physician, I'm thinking about the 12 years that we had our hospital. And there was, you can care without looking serious. Remember we tricked them. You came and stayed in our home as our guests, as our friends. There was a huge amount of affection. There was a farm. There were cats and dogs and birds, and there was all of these traps <laughs> to make you a comfortable person. And that, that generally the ethic was everybody hugs and everybody's affectionate. And so that that environment, we were the doctors for the largest motorcycle gang in the U.S. <laughs> that, and it was so fun to have lots of wide variety of people in the home. And the home setting and the sharing and caring is seductive. Why do people go, if you've been to the Oregon Country Fair or Burning Man or Rainbow Gatherings or you know, big, here it is, Easter weekend, family gatherings or weddings. People are <coughs> often nicer to people that they hate at a wedding than at any other time. <laughs> so you, you find out. I'm not there to intimidate with my playfulness or to act like, you know, ha ha, you're dying. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm, you, you don't, I don't have one patch to offer. I have, here's a person and my deck is 52 cards. Which, which ones am I going to use? And you can tell, you look them in the eye and you, you see fear, you see discomfort and you can apologize. Or you can have a place if it's your, if you have an office and your office has toys and, you're, and you create an atmosphere, you can that atmosphere will help midwife a good time. Hmm. And, and I don't know how to get around 
the vulgar cost of everything. Mm. I've tricked it by being communal and saying this was going to be my revolution. Mm. And to show richness. That's why the salary will be $300 a month. I want to scare people how low our salary is. <coughs> and that people can feel, I think, that whatever it is, they feel dedication, whatever that even means. They can feel you care for them. <coughs> and if they come back, they a lot of times they come back for the care. And if, if they are uptight, you can sit down, hold their hand. Or if that's not a thing to do, you, you can try more formal. <laughs> Birthday. <laughs> but I find people are, are so happy to be in a relaxed atmosphere, especially when they're nervous about their illnesses that if they think you're competent, I mean, if your goofiness makes them question your competence, that might be an issue. Put a stethoscope around your neck. <laughs> I'm partly playing with you, but it's, you know, we're such a heavy society. You, you can have five people on an elevator that are all intensely avoiding each other. <laughs> Masterfully avoiding each other. That's where we are. Whew. No wonder. And to think that that needs Prozac. <laughs> yes? So I'm sure as a free clinic, uh, there were times when there was no way you could see everybody who came. How sure. Stick around. Okay. So one thing is to stick around. You know, don't let me be the uh, gatekeeper, because I'll just say yes. <laughs> so we had, it was, and in a way, by sticking around, they're working in the garden, they're so a lot of times, whatever they came for has gone away. <laughs> Certainly with, with emotional trouble. That there's a volleyball game over here, and there's a, some really weird stuff over here. <laughs> there, there was... Uh, stick around. And you can't help everybody. You know, when our hospital is open, we will have to say West Virginians only. When before, our last active year, we had people from 40 states and 18 countries come in a year, in our last year. But because I had to go public, I get, I get letters from 120 countries, please can I come to your hospital? And you have to be sober about that. You. I'm, I'm not going to do 7.8 minutes. I, I need to feel great about, about my interaction with the person. Not every staff person will have that kind of time, but they, every staff person will have the right to be exactly the staff person they want to be. And then we will see that many people and realize that we need other places. Yes, ma'am? Could you describe to us the vision you have that you want so that we could all hold that vision for you? As far as I, th I think I kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> We're building a 40-bed rural community hospital. There'll be 12 pods for 10 adults per pod and their children. And, and so that's where all the 120 staff will live. There'll be a school for social change, and I can mention that now. Um, the School for Designing a Society, the missing link for us. 20 years we connected with a school in Illinois called the School for Designing a Society that teaches social change. And so the one thing we do feel comfortable in charging for is education. So my lectures charge and other people's lectures and the school and but the clowning and the and the medicine is free. And we have a student who just finished a semester there and she's crazy enough now to go back for another semester. And uh, 
chiropractor who referred a man, young man to us who I loved and he came on our Russia trip this year. So if you're not knowing what you're doing with your life and you like to be a focused activist, the school is a place to go and I have brochures <coughs> if you'd like to get them afterward. So the 310 acres, I mean, I, I would like to uh, really help build up the what used to be a large otter population. So one of my jobs is going to be otters. <laughs> I, and we'll have a fully complicated farm. We've been involved in permaculture and a lot of other kinds of uh, farming things. I also, will, since I'm an easy memorizer, I'll probably be in most of the plays. <laughs> and maybe 30,000 square feet devoted to the arts, fully modern stage, and all these areas for the arts to be there. A 14th generation landscape architect and from Japan, and wow. a gardener that was 15th generation gardener are going to design a Japanese garden for us, so that'll be we have the spot where we'll build three interconnecting tree houses hmm. where families or staff could take a retreat. I don't know how much detail you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you have 44 years of thinking about something, you probably have detail, <laughs> particularly if you're optimistic. So. I, I can't even that you know, one nice thing is that we've, four, oh, I didn't mention, 40 beds will be for guests. So everything from health students, I've, uh, where I haven't been a great fundraiser, I've collected string quartets and every imaginable kind of performer and artist and odd person here and there so that, so that a person could say if they were a nature of path, they could say, look, every other year I'm going to come there with my family for a week. And they'll do whether they're camping there or or staying in the in the 40 beds. So that'll be, and the school will be both a school for for social change, but also a school where I'm a literary fanatic, and I, I plan to have two weeks on Virginia Woolf is going to be the first thing that I organize in the school when I'm there. So people that are fanatical for Virginia Woolf, anybody here? Okay, it's not, never hard to find fanatics for Virginia Woolf for obvious reasons. So the school will be for everything involved in social change that we organize, but as well as any interest we have, we can bring it in at the school. Four libraries huge film library. My fantasy is no TV. Oh, darn. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mentioning that you said that you were comfortable charging for education. Yes. As a pre-med student myself, what kind of advice do you have for someone who is fully aware they will graduate with close to half a million dollars in debt, but would like to do the type of work that you're doing? Well, one thing, there's no debtor's prison, so I hate to say this, just don't care. <laughs> you know, it's their problem you owe that much money. Okay, so anyone can go to Africa and work the rest of their life. With a USMD, you're, you're, in, you're set. <laughs> and I, when I started Gesundheit and I graduated, I owed some money, nothing like what you're saying. I was a war orphan, but I owed money, and they would call up and say, look, come by, take what you want. And when I did start making money nine years into it, then I paid it back. I would not feel, I would rather you practice the way you dream of and just not worry about your debt. Do you feel it's like irresponsible that it's that costly. I, you know, it's, yeah. pardon me, yeah. that it's, 
It's our world. Do you feel like there's a genuine need for more physicians, especially knowing the way that med medical schools train the way that they do? You know, doctors are telling their kids not to become doctors. There is a shortage. There is a particular shortage of nice ones. Okay? Because not only often are they not nice people, but the practice of medicine in the current sucks. There's no happy hospital in the world. I hear from medical students in 120 countries and none of them like how they're being educated. None of them. Never got a positive article or a letter. And I'm not fishing for negative ones. They're just, the, a lot of them are young students and they thought they were going to be compassionate doctors caring for people and they didn't see where that was in their education. And so we, you know, it's one of the areas that we need revolution. I'm, I, I don't know if you know about Elam, the Cuban medical school. It's free education. They pay you to go there. I've got people who I think want to build our hospital and also want to build five Cuban medical schools connected to five free hospitals in five African countries. So I'm hoping that that happens. And it's, it's one of the examples of how our society is messed up, that a person who wants to serve humanity owes a quarter of a million dollars. Mm. So I say whoever had that much money to give you probably can, you know, <laughs> suck up on the loan. <laughs> Yes, ma'am? Um, in medical practice, did you ever have, outside of family medicine, did you ever have a specific specialty and or age group that was your favorite to work with? You know, I, I, I liked it all. I mean, what I, maybe because I had my own three mental hospitalizations at 17 is when, I, when my life changed, I... I, and I saw that almost none of the people we had in our home were radiant. So I worked a lot on radiance and, and that sort of thing. And trying, you know, in those days, the only time, place acupuncture was mentioned was in the National Enquirer. Now you, you don't know that. But I mean, in those days, all of complementary medicine was in the National Enquirer as quackery. And so it was really, I can remember black flower remedies. Uh, holy shit, you float a flower in a beaker at, you know, on a full moon. And, and then there was all these other things. That, I remember a woman, a woman from New York, huge woman with gigantic breasts and what she said her treatment was was naked breast massage. And so we said, sure, come on here. And so in the living room, you could, you know, and I'd, and I'd love to like take a biker in there and say, look, well, here's a, yeah. So just seeing, being introduced to all of complementary medicine and seeing it, and to, to hear its explanation for itself related to allopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. You know, what, what, what's bothered me the most is violence and injustice. I mean, that's what got me into what I do anyway, and, and that's the, you know, I'm not kidding. I think we're going to be extinct this century. I tell every medical school when I lecture there, you're going to doctor our extinction. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. But the, how many movies on fracking do you need to see? Or the destruction of bees. And, and so many, there's so many features. Maybe you say, well, what's it actually going to be, doctor, that's going to make us extinct? I say, which of the 10,000, 100,000 things do you want me to mention? And so I was always trying to a lot of it was trying to encourage people to group up. You know, we're in a bad economic time. If you have 
traditional four-person family, mom, dad, and two kids, if 10 of those groups lived together, 15 if they were all wage earners. So if you had 20 wage earners living in a house, 15 can lose their job and they're still covered. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any idea about that. The tribal life, our tribal life, if we knew how to get along even with ourselves, much less our partner, and how much easier it is to get along with your partner if you're actually in the community of people who love you. Mm -hmm. So those things were the hardest to push or hardest to interest people in. And so trying to be that example, learn ourselves how to be communal. Wow, there's so many hands. Uh, let's go up here this way and then we'll go around and I'll be here till morning. Uh huh. Yeah. I have a book by Patch Adams that I got at a meeting back east. And I wonder if you still publish the. Achoo service, come on. It's the IT world. Yeah. It's called Achoo. Achoo. Achu, for Gesundheit. Yeah, I mean, since I'm not in the IT world, I know we put out e-newsletters for years. I mean, we were back in the relic period. So we started in 71, which outside of Turing and some other computer people, there weren't too many computers, that's when the room this size held a computer. <laughs> huh? Can you talk more about your experience in Chernobyl? I mean, what would you, what does one say? And I've been at Fukushima. Did you have any um, health problems after being there? No, I, I really, I haven't been sick as an adult. Magic <laughs> One thing I've done, and please do this, for 45 years I've been really regular with aerobics, weightlifting, and yoga. And so I actually don't know yet a negative thing about being 70. You know? And it's so much more interesting because of all the stuff you collected in your 20s and 30s and there was nothing in my 20s and 30s that begins to approach how weird and strange I get to be now. <laughs> so, y yes. Um, I, as a younger person, I don't understand how your hospital cannot be funded. <laughs> I mean, with like Kickstarter and someone helping organize that, I don't understand. I don't understand it either. What I know is that almost no one has donated to it. So how much do you... You know, I, I get audiences and giant standing ovations and incredible letters, and I just go on. I, I think around the money issue, you have to be relaxed. You know, we're going to pass the hat tonight. Somebody is back at the door, and I'll be, I was very thankful they let me do that. I don't know. You know, maybe someone in the audience. 98% of the promises made me, I'm going to send you this, were lies. Mm -hmm. And there's just the whole, money is God. You know, there may be other gods. I know this is Easter weekend, but people, <laughs> the worship is on money. Mm -hmm. If we look at enthusiasm for the thing worshipped, it's money. And I, I uh, since the movie, I've made mostly a million dollars a year. I, I, so of all the money donated to Gesundheit in 44 years, money I've personally donated has accounted for over 90%. So it's like a hobby. And... You know, I've had a lot of fun along the way. So I, I don't know what it is. And I know I don't want to be bummed out by it. That I'm just going to keep at it and it's fun all the time. And failing means we're active in 40 countries. And, you know, we just got funding for two vet trips, so we... Whoopee. <laughs> you help me for crying out loud. <laughs> 
I, I constantly, particularly since the movie, the number of people that said, I'm going to get you all your money. The numbers of who said that are impressive. <laughs> and I think it's going to happen. Maybe that's why I'm still healthy. <laughs> We're going to go up around here, okay? So keep your arms, yes. My last question for you was, um, so I, I, unless I misunderstood you, you mentioned that you personally don't have a, a belief in supernatural the, or the divine, that type of You know, thing. I am a born, you live, you die person. So. Do well at living. But then I've also heard you mention faith healing. So how do you have a position? Well, you saw me pray. Right. I've prayed to thousands. Oh, I'll tell you, let me tell you my experience, okay? Third year medical student, emergency room, family brings in their dead child. The asshole doctor says, oh, nothing more we can do here. We'll call a nurse, meaning woman. And the truth is, I went into medicine to be with that family at that moment. And I saw that the bracelet said Baptist. I said, do you mind if we pray? Because I'm well read. My spiritual library is about 1,800 books. And so I got down on my knees, put my hands together, and I did some poetry for their son being with Jesus. They wrote me letters for 10 years, how it changed the experience. So ever since then, I'm a Christian with a Christian, a Buddhist with a Buddhist, an atheist with an atheist. You know, I have this idea religion was created as another way for men to control women and, uh, and, and a lot of other things, you know, that there's, and I, I'm comfortable dying. And I, you know, the Mayfly lives 18 hours. If it was a human, it would be going 1759, 1758. You know, I'm more than happy. Uh, for whatever people believe in. When I hear a faithful, and there are not that many faithful people, but when I really hear a faithful person speak of their love of God, as I do especially with the poor in Latin America, that I hear them use a language I use for friend. So when, when I hear God, I relate in my world that that means friend. And so I'm a friend worshiper. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, two things. First thing, real quick, thank you for the work that you do with the veterans. As a veteran of the United States, they've been formal. I appreciate that. Uh, second thing is, you keep mentioning that, that everyone in the world is lonely, or alone in some sense. Um, I hate to be the one to bring this up, but that's okay. Sometimes someone's got to do it. With the passing of Robin Williams, who was a good friend of yours, that has brought national or worldwide attention to mental disorders, whether it's bipolar, depression, any of that. And you, you talk about having people come into Goose and Titan, they, you know, oh, go play volleyball or whatever weird activity they're doing right there, and they forget about it. But do they really forget about it? And how, I mean, I really wish what happened with Robin could have been prevented. <coughs> but there's some people, how do you work with that? Well, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are very happy with any attention brought to anything to do with mental illness because they are their multi-multi-billion dollar drugs. I never disliked a patient enough to give them one of those drugs. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, there is no disease depression. Depression is a symptom of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so, I, uh, I have a lot of hostility to psychopharmaceuticals. Gigantic Mind Psychology Psychiatry Library. And what I know anyone can do is decide to be who they decide to be. It's not taught anywhere. And their traditional response will be, I can't. So when a person would come to me and said, I'm depressed all the time and we were open, I'd handcuff them to me. <laughs> and drag them through my day and you know I'd have traps for them like little puppies and I'd get them down there with puppies and they'd be that and that and that and loving their so I'd say is this one of those depressed all the time moments you're having <laughs> yeah, and that's what they would do is ha 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 and it's you know why don't we use labels like eccentric okay you're just as weird <laughs>
But you label somebody ADD, uh, you label somebody schizophrenic, you've just ruined their dating life. <laughs> you've ruined their employment record. You, you know, those labels are horrible. Freud, in one of his last books, Civilization and Its Discontent, said maybe mental illness is a healthy response to a messed up society. Yes. Mm. Oh my mm. So, so I'm, I'm gonna, my family doctor says, if, if you think you're mentally ill, you can stop it. I know you can stop it, and by living with us, I can show you when you're not. Because the house will be so creative, so affectionate, so strange, and and that you'll be enlisted to help me and you won't know that I'm tricking you. We're tricky. And it's hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bring him by. You're my next therapist. Yes. Isn't it interesting that the most important thing in the world, we're not even, most people say, you can't teach compassion, you can't teach loving, so I'm not going to tell people how to do it. I'm going to say it's not done, let's have some, let's have some intensives and experiments. I can tell you that my education library is about 900 books. And there are a lot of fabulous ones. My favorite educator is a feminist educator, Nell Noddings, N-O-D-D-I-N-G-S. If you read her latest edition of her book, Caring, and her book, Happiness and Health, and Critical Lessons and Starting at Home, those four books will give you one person's excitement for possibility. Now, I, I imagine that if I was involved in the curriculum, but by seventh or eighth grade, all of the other classes would be four days a week, and, there, and love day would be the day you go out into the community and assimilate love into the community. And, uh, you know, there'd be a huge amount of affection. Right now, teachers can't even hug pupils. Yes. Screw that rule. <laughs> you know, rest me. Put me in jail. I'm hugging my students especially the ones crying in my class. So, we have to rebel. You're getting ready to rebel. I mean, hell, it looks soon. Huh? Any day, right. Well, what an experiment. Try Nell Noddings. I know D-D-I-N-G-S. Yes. I'd need a four-hour interview, okay, because uh, I don't have, I can tell you this, who's only bipolar? Okay, anyone here only bipolar? Just ask your partner. Okay. We're, we're, it's not an illness, you understand, there's no physiology or biochemistry, it's just a label. But you understand there is no biochemistry. There's no biochemistry for schizophrenia. I'm not trying to talk you out of your medicine. You feel great about where you are, and I would not want to tackle that at all. 
if I was open and you said, look, I'd like to get off my medication, I'd tackle that. I think at this point, since I've been through 10 years or 12 years of getting better, at this point, maybe I could, but I don't think that there is any way I could have before. And I just, I mean, your ideas are wonderful, but I think the general population doesn't have access to that. And I don't know. Right, the general population can't afford our healthcare system. You know, my, my son was getting ready with his wife to deliver my first granddaughter a year ago, and everything was fine with the pregnancy, and the child was stillborn. And it didn't spend, she, the mother didn't spend the night in the hospital, it was in a room off the emergency room for 20 hours. Guess what the bill was? $50,000. Okay, screw those people. And, and I understand the relief you're having with the medication. When I was in medical school, the medicines given to someone with that label, one dose could cause permanent central nervous tissue damage, tardive dyskinesia. So I wasn't going to give any patients tardive dyskinesia. I actually, we had 3,000 patients that were either labeled bipolar or schizophrenic, and we never medicated. Some of them left. They didn't want to clear it up. But I would be a doctor that if you wanted to clear it up, I would work to clear it up. Right. And I would, you would see in me that I thought you could. There is no, you understand, it's just schizophrenia and bipolar are labels. There, there is no biochemistry of schizophrenia. There is no biochemistry of bipolar. They are just labels and they're frequently used they're a multi-billion dollar industry and I think our society makes it it's such an unhealthy society correspond with me I would never as happy as you are on it I would never try to take well, you I, off at this point I've never been happy on it when I was in college I couldn't read because of lithium but it but when I moved out here, the, the doctors in Washington are superlative to the doctors in South Dakota where I'm from. And they put me on a considerably lower dose of lithium and added a couple other things to kind of uh, stabilize. And I've been a completely different person since I moved out here. Um, do you give yourself any credit? I do. Okay, uh, that's good. That I, I think what I'm saying is that in my 20s, as someone who didn't have any access to anything else, it was... Oh, I had to, or I wouldn't have looked. But now that I'm older, I want to try to get off of it because I don't like the idea of sustaining effects. Don't go off it quickly. Well, no. Very slow. Five months. Very, 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 very slow because all those drugs are strong and you do not want to go through the right. withdrawal. Yeah. And as you're slowly going off over five or six months, come on with the fabulous self you are. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, a lot of things have been happening. I feel like I could, but thank you. I just that in my 20s, I think that it was essential and it might be for other people. Right. Well, because the work I put people through so that they didn't need the medicine was hell. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. they had to decide to make themselves a fabulous person. And it's a hell of a lot easier to take a pill. Cut the crap, Doc, and give me a pill, was the call. Let me just say, 9 o'clock, people are leaving. I hope that the, the donation bucket is out there at the end. Please help me. And then tomorrow, through the Moisture Festival, if you haven't been to the Moisture Festival, you're blowing a good time here in Seattle. It's four weekends. Please... Uh, Please look it up. Let me actually tell you where it is. Oh my God, I have the information here. It's a four hour workshop called Living a Life of Joy, where I propose the audacity of never having another bad day. Okay? And I'm doing it as a fundraiser for the Moisture Festival because performers, you think health people are poor, performers are really poor, especially if they're vaudevillians. So, it's at the uh, Boylston Avenue East, 
127 Boylston Avenue East, Seattle. It starts at noon, it's four hours. There's an hour and a half of really fun exercises and then a very intense encounter with a really happy person and ideas on being happy forever and then a Q&A where some might try to challenge the impossible. So, if, if that matters and, you know, if anybody you know is suffering or is dealing with people who are suffering from not having fun every day, uh, it will be useful. And remember, I also have these brochures if you're interested in the School for Designing a Society. I see it's after nine, so does that mean I should ask myself? No. You don't have to, but... Poetry. I just, I want to poetry. No. <laughs> okay. No poetry. Okay. How about if we did one and two? Is that okay? Let's just try these. Um, sir, I wanted to ask because um, you say that everybody is lonely, and you know, it's hard to find people to talk to. Most everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and some people have fear. Um, Most. Um, Boredom, loneliness, and fear is the normal American. Have you ever felt loneliness and fear? Like, as a person who practices positivity and... I, I mean, I've never experienced loneliness. You know, my mom loved me too much, like that mom in the movie. Okay, so... And I'm a really friendly, extreme extrovert. So, uh, I've never... Fear, I've had... You know, I get death threats about ten times a year. I don't usually... I, I was almost killed in Chechnya two years ago, and I knew I had to really get out of there really quickly. So I got out of there really quickly, and fear was probably a motivational force there. <laughs> you know, I've been beaten up a lot of times. I don't hit back. And, uh, you know, I, fear's not my style, really. I, I, and I, w I want to work for peace and justice. And if I was really frightened, I'd shut up. <laughs> I irritate people, you know. I, I call ourselves the number one mass murdering terrorist nation, and some people don't like the truth. <laughs> they don't like that I'm pro-choice and pro-euthanasia, and there are a lot of other reasons that one could hate me. And I still, I would rather be honest then be safe and I shit I'm 70 next month so I've already had a lot of fun <laughs> yes sir as one who's a little older than you are you're wearing one of my favorite colors so my question is why <laughs> guess his favorite color <laughs> why blue <laughs> Okay, that's easy to answer. I'm going to guess, but go ahead. Okay, you probably won't guess. Um, I, was, I was on the movie set, okay, and the movie was being done. My younger son was with me, and, and we were having fun, and they had these Academy Award winning makeup artists there. And I went in there one day and said, make me into a beautiful woman. And that was easy. And they said, would you like some hair color? So I called up my partner, Susan, and said, what color? And she said, blue. And so that was 15, 16 years ago. And I thought, oh yeah, dye your hair and it'll grow out. But I liked it. It seemed to go with everything I wore. And to tell you the truth, I speak at a lot of prisons and middle schools and high schools and colleges and they listen better. You know, so it, it's beautiful. I can show it down, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still a hippie, you know, peace and love, you probably got that. So, it's pretty. And, uh, yeah, anyone can do it. I mean, even if you're bald, you can get a tattoo. <laughs> so that question was easy. It's never too late. You've got lots of possibilities. Okay, these two 
two people and then we're done? It's really hard to talk about it. Well, let me tell you something about a sponge nose, okay? It really discourages people from being clowns. These are like little things to wear for a few minutes and go, I can't breathe in them. So, don't let this. Get a professional nose. Uh, there's a website that we use. If it's not on our... I didn't tell you how to get my address. It's on... Ironically, it's on our website. <laughs> I've not been to our website, but I know my address is there. And probably the contact for Jeff Summerlee. Remember, a clown nose is like a diaphragm. It does no good on the nightstand. It's supposed to be <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay. So my question is, is sort of story and sort of question. You impacted my life long before you probably ever realized it. Yeah, I hear you. Blame me. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm blaming you for it. Okay. Why don't you stand up and talk to no the deaf so, person? My my story or my my question is both story and question. So you impacted my life in that my father was extremely sick when I was growing up, but he never once made it sad to go and visit him in the hospital. He would always chase down nurses with RC cars and weird funny hats and all sorts of fun things that just made my, my time in visiting him absolutely incredible and memorable and loving. How does it feel to know that you have impacted not just the people here, but other lives as well that you might not have talked to before moments like this? Well, duh. <laughs> you know, I, if it didn't have that impact, I would try something else, right? I mean, I want a different world. I'm, I'm, I'm here to infect minds. You know, that love is seductive and fun is seductive, service is seductive, and, and I... You know, it's why I'm not discouraged or, you know, I've tried, I've worked every single day for 44 plus years to get a hospital and I've never had any discouragement. The feedback I get is overwhelming. I have maybe a stack of 100,000 letters that most people would like one of them in their lifetime. So I, you know, it, it's, I'm not made of steel, I'm fragile. And so it helps hold me up and keep me at it and Again, if what I did did not have that impact, I would change what I do because I'm, I can't force people into being nice. I have to trick them. <laughs> Thank you. And last question, yes. Um, you said that what you do doesn't take skill, but it takes audacity. And even though you may not be feel fearful or shy or you're extroverted, there are people who aren't that way. And how would you say to those people to cultivate more audacity? You know, a simple thing is to get a pair of tidy whities and wear it on your head. <laughs> because then you draw attention to yourself and you can say a doctor prescribed it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, okay, I'm totally a constructed person. You understand, at 18 in my third mental hospital, I said I'm never going to have another bad day as a political act. I make me. In, every, in Buddhism, it's called mindfulness. In every second of my life, I'm deciding how to be my best possible self for your question. For every single moment of my life. Because I don't like, you know, the... I'm working for those 2,000 children I've held in my arms dying of starvation. The three-year-old with gonorrhea, my youngest case of gonorrhea. And the hell that I've seen, I work for them. And that, that I make my motivation. And it's something that tomorrow's workshop will be very clear ways to, to do that. That one option in life is to be exactly who you decide to be and you will really like living that life. Because you can change it any time, and if that day you're exactly who you decide to be, you'll like how you sleep. And that it, you know, the, to say a person is shy is an imprisonment. 
It's just who they're deciding to be today. Yeah. And anyone can... Robin Williams was, a, I think, an extreme introvert. I lived in his house. He hid in his room. That he turned on extrovert when he wanted to be that extroverted person that everybody loved. But it was hard to be as famous as he is and to go out in the world that actually isn't caring about him. They want a photograph or they want something. And he just would like some to be left alone. So, you know, go. anyone can be, please hear me, if I have anything to tell you, anyone can be exactly who they decide to be every single second the rest of your life. And you will really like what happens. And you'll actually get really skilled at the person you decide to be. Because you're that person all the time. In many variations of a theme. I'd like to thank Brenda, my dear friend, for helping midwife this, and John Bastier. For me. Can I finish the poem? Oh my God! One of the shorter ones, I, I know. And again, I do invite you. If any of you know how I can get that hospital built, please help me. I'm sure you know that if we could show a fully modern hospital at 10% of the cost, how dangerous it'll be. The whole world knows us already. They'll come there because of the school. They'll be able to study how to do it. And uh, I'm going to do it until I can't. So please help. And I think there are going to be people at the back there that'll help. Remember tomorrow, if you want to come to the workshop, does any, anybody didn't get the address that would like it? Okay, let's try it one more time. Be the town crier, 127 Boylston Avenue East, Seattle. And uh, it's a fundraiser for the Moisture Festival because they are fabulous. Who's gone to the Moisture Festival? I'm just curious. Vaudeville, International Vaudevillians. You give yourself a treat to go there and see these people who've mastered their crafts. And uh, if you're interested in uh, the School for Designing a Society, I'm one of their teachers. And uh, its question is, what do, you, what do you want? And what's the design to get what you want? And uh, I would say that I've been a student of theirs since I met them 25 years ago. And, it's made me a lot more dangerous a person than had I not met them. Particularly my partner, Susan, who is deadly. Would you agree? Scary. She's so smart. So, uh, thank you again, and uh, whoopee. Whoopee. Oh, right. There's a blue basket, plastic, sometimes known as a garbage bag, that you put your And since I called money kind of garbage light, <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you two poems. One by a poet, probably the most beloved poet living today is Mary Oliver, right? Some people know Mary Oliver. Yes. Okay, so I'll give you one of her poems. When death comes. When death comes, like a hungry bear in autumn. When death comes and takes all the bright coins out of his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measle pox. When death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades. I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like in that cottage of darkness. Therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each person as a flower, as common as a field daisy, 
and the singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does toward silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world in my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particularly real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. And maybe another woman poet, Mae Swinson? No, Mary Ann Moore. I'll do Mary Ann Moore. She must have been a good poet because after she died they put her on a stamp. And they're not putting a lot of poets on stamps. <laughs> what are years is the title of her poem. What is her innocence? What is her guilt? All are naked. None is safe. And whence is courage? The unanswered question, the resolute doubt, Dumbly calling, deftly listening, that in misfortune even death encourages others. <clears throat> and in its defeat stirs the soul to be strong. He sees deep and is glad who accedes to mortality and in his imprisonment rises upon himself as the sea in a chasm struggling to be free and unable to be in its surrendering finds its continuing. So, he who strongly feels, behaves. The very bird grown taller as he sings, steals his form straight up. Though he is captive, his mighty singing says, satisfaction is a lowly thing. How pure a thing is joy. This is mortality. This is eternity. And now for the other four hours. <laughs> Thank you very much.